Well, praise God. What do you say? We give God some praise in his house. Come on, saints. Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Come on. Let's act like we're on our way to heaven. Come on and thank him this morning. My, uh, my, my, my devotion this morning, David Wilkerson devotion, was uh, shared during time when he was going through some uh, especially really hard uh, stuff in his life. And, and he had questioned God about, you know, when the fire was going in. And God said, when you begin to thank me for what I've already done for you. Mm. You know, sometimes when we're going through the stuff, man, we forget. And this is a month of Thanksgiving. Amen? So we certainly want to thank the Lord. But His Word says in Isaiah chapter 55, starting verse 8, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. So if you don't thank God, God don't think like us. Amen? The world would be in a world of hurt if God thought like us, would He not? Amen? My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sword and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Say, thank God God knows best. Thank God. Thank God God knows best. Amen. Come on, let's pray and invite His presence. Father, we come to you this wonderful, beautiful, glorious morning, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the sun on our faces, Lord. Even though there was a storm, Lord, even though weeping may endure for the night, joy cometh in the morning, Lord. We know, Lord, that the enemy comes in like a flood at times, but you raise up a standard against him, and that standard is your son, Lord. It's always the son, Lord. And this morning, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, God, and we ask you to let our worship be a sweet-smelling offering to you this morning, Lord. For your word says that you inhabit the praise of your people. May we praise you with full hearts this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You can stand this morning. Listen, give thanks for this amazing grace. Amen. Amen. Oh 
Thank you. The Lord showed me something this morning and reminded me of this, and it's for us. One of the problems that the disciples had with Jesus is he wouldn't conform to their image of what he should be like. Amen? I mean, you see it through the whole Gospels. They, he, he refused to conform to what they thought he should be. And the Lord asked me a question this morning, and, and, he, and he just brought some people to mind. And he asked me, he said, Alan, do you truly love this person? Or you, do you love the idea of what you think they should be? Do you love the idea of what they can be? Or do you just love the person? And I think the guys started out following Jesus because they loved the idea of what they thought he could be. They thought he could be the king of Israel that would restore to them their their headship, their power, would kick the enemy out of their life, out of their country, and everything. And, and so they started out with this idea of loving him and following him for their idea of what he could be to them. And if you and I only love people for our idea of what they could be to us, then we hadn't taken on his heart yet because if you only love me for your idea of what I could be, we both in for a really long wait. Because he's still got a lot of work to do on me. Still got a lot of, of shaping and, 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 and circumcising to do in my life. But if we truly love each other the way Jesus wants to, wants us to, then it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what image you're conforming to. It's just simply that I love you because God lives in me and He is love. Somebody asked me this question the other day. What do you do when you don't know what to do. And I said, that's easy. Hebrews 13, 8 says, love never fails. So if you don't know what to do in a situation, just throw some love in there. Throw some love in there, you know, because it's an act, man. It's a force in our will. It's not an emotion. It's not a feel-good thing. It's not a, it's not a, you know, what I can get back out of this deal. Love costs something. And as we go into prayer this morning, we got some real dear friends in Lynette. Matter of fact, they were our praise and worship leaders in Lynette. Their little teenage daughter ran away from home last night. They need prayer. They need prayer desperately. I can't imagine what their hearts are feeling like. Nick had to go to the uh, emergency room last night. Had some stuff going on with blood pressure and different things. He's back home. They still didn't really find anything out. You know, he's recovering from his surgery. Talked to Cheryl Friday, Mike Soils home. She went down to carry him home, but he still needs prayer. Yes, amen. Reg is still recuperating, needs prayer. Praise God. Carlton, uh, Collins had his uh, shoulder surgery Friday. Jackie said she couldn't talk him into checking his brain, but shoulder surgery went well. I talked to her, so it's a break for a later time. But we all know the pain involved with surgery. Dudley, Brenda Jones, Aubrey English, Ray Fair, Susan Lancaster, the Welch family still, Rhonda Matthews, Kim Brown, Cynthia, and Joe Lamont. Lexi's recovering, doing very well. So when you join me this morning, let some love go in your heart for these on your screen. Because the Bible says love never fails. It's the only thing that never fails. And if we truly love people, these are people that trust us to pray for them. And we'll go to the throne room in faith this morning. If you got a prayer need this morning, need the Lord to touch it, would you just wave it at the Lord? Let him see it. Seize your heart. Let's go. Father, your word says for us to join hands. We lift up holy hands. To pray ye one for another, Lord God, that our strength may not fail. So, Father, this morning we do exactly as you say. We come boldly into the throne room of grace, Lord, to make our petitions known. We come in in the name of Jesus, Lord, because there's no other name under heaven or on earth whereby men may be saved. And as a high priest of our confession, we can come boldly into the throne of grace and talk to you about our situations, Lord. <clears throat> These we called out on this list I was holding, Lord. They're in need, Lord. They're in some right now need, Lord. You're right now, God. You said now faith. Hebrews 11 says, now faith. That's the faith right now that's needed, Lord, to reach heaven, to bombard heaven on behalf of those that we love today, Lord. 
that are hurting, Lord. Some of them are getting older, Lord. Some of them got other situations going on, Lord. But nothing is too big for you, Lord. My Bible tells me that you are willing to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can hope or ask or think of according to the power that works in us, Lord. The power in us is our faith, Lord. Our faith in your word that by his stripes we are healed, Lord. Lord, every one of these on our list, up on the screen, Lord, all these papers, Lord, your word is just as true to them, Lord. We read it in Isaiah 54 a while ago, Lord. Your word will never return to you void without accomplishing that you set it out to do, God. <coughs> not one single thing that was prophesied about Jesus that did not come to pass. Not one single thing that he said that he would do that he has not done, Lord. You are faithful. You are trustworthy. You will do to depend on, Lord. You've never lied. You've never failed us yet, Lord. And you said that you sent your word and healed us all, Lord. So, God, this morning we lay hold to the promises of God for each and every person, Lord, that's in need this morning, Lord. We seal it, Lord God, by saying, in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise and a Come on. Come on. Let's the word one more time. Let's the word one more time. There is no yes. one like you. Yes, sir. Lord, that he'll take the shield of faith up that repels all the fire darts from hell, Lord, 
And last but not least, the sword of the Spirit shall be his weapon of choice, Lord. Father, I pray these things in the name of Jesus, and we offer grace and back to you this morning, Lord. And we thank you for this life. You said in your word that before you formed him in his mother's womb, you knew him. And you ordained him, Lord God. You already have an ordained life set out before him, Lord. And God, we ask that you help us help him find that pathway, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise. wakes up now. Praise God. Amen. Thank you guys. Appreciate y'all. So no, we appreciate our praise and worship. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to take a communion this morning, so we'll, while everybody, while the choir is finding their way back around, we'll give them just a minute. Tell you what we'll do. We'll just go ahead and run the announcements real quick before we take the communion that'll give them time to come around. Oh, baby dedication check. I already have that. Thank you, Lord. Uh, mission pledges next Sunday. Uh, cards are out in the in the four years of different places for you to. And this is important, y'all. It's really important y'all do this because when we meet and the board and we decide what's going to be our, our, our payout, our support to missionaries in the coming year, we take these pledges to give us an idea to make sure that we're going to be able to meet uh, the commitments that we've already made. So if you would please, and, and it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's called a pledge. And the pledge simply means that as the Lord enables me, okay? So it's not a, it's not a something that you're absolutely bound to. But I've never seen if the Lord lays on your heart a certain amount of give where he didn't provide a way for you to give it. Amen? So mission pledge card, they're out. We'll take those up. Uh, next Sunday. Also, Carmen. Say Carmen. Carmen. Okay, how many know who I'm talking about when I say Carmen? Raise your hand. Okay, praise God. We got a few more. Some of them went and, and dug out mom and dad CDs and, and, and ate their uh, cassette tapes and, and listened to some of them. No, Pastor, we Googled Carmen. We got him, yes. Anyway, they will, he will be here next Sunday night in concert. We've got to have some help. Brother Bobby has outlined just one of the most awesome plans I've got on my desk, and we need volunteers, and he's got to handle for people in the parking lot, handle parking. What we're going to do is set a couple tables up out front, so we'll need at least two people per table because we're going to scan temperatures. Okay, so if somebody comes up in the running temp, I'm sorry, we're not, uh, you know, just, we're not going to, uh, won't be allowed into the sanctuary. So. We're going to scan temperatures. We're going to have people in here to see folks. It's first come, first serve. There's no saving chairs. So the usher will come in and start seating people from the front to the back. When we get full in here, we plan on overflowing to the fellowship hall if we can get internet, if we can get availability to where we can uh, send it from here to out there. And we're still working on that. So the kids will go upstairs, Ryan and Katie. We're going to take the kids upstairs, so please do not not come because of children. Or, or if you want them to say that's up, totally up to you. But he's coming. He's got a powerful testimony. The Lord has healed him several times from cancer when uh, doctors and everyone else had given up on him. So I'm sure he'll share some of that, and, and he'll sing. It'll be very it'll be good stuff, powerful stuff. Amen. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, spread the word. Amen. Which I don't think. It's in the paper. It's going to be in the journal, and it's out on the uh, on the uh, website. Praise the Lord. Uh, hanging of the green last Sunday. Can you believe that's here already? No. I saw people posting yesterday where they asked, "Was it okay to go ahead and put Christmas stuff up?" It's your house. You do what you want to do. Whatever your husband allows, I reckon you can get by with it. Amen. First God. In my case, as long as I don't have to do it, I don't care. You can put, I, I voted to leave the blessing tree up in the foyer year round, you know. I shot that down, so anyway. <laughs> but we won't have an argument with that, praise God. No. I do want to take a moment, me and Irma both are overwhelmed by the love that, that the church has shown us, and by your gifts and kind words. And I will say this, and this means more to me than anyone at anything else. When someone says to me, when I come to church, I get fed. 
And, and that means more to me than anything in this world. It really does. And more than any monetary gifts. Don't stop the monetary gifts. <laughs> or the gifts cards to Outback, because we love them. But it really means a lot to me that the Lord will speak through me to the place to where you can hear from God and not from me. Amen? Oh. Uh, about tonight. Harvest Festival. Okay. I'm on. Okay. A few things. Uh, yes, tonight is our, our fall fest. And uh, if you didn't know, it's going to be from 6 to 8. We'll be here. Um, but it's we're going all out as normal, okay? So we're going to have everything that we normally have. Uh, some of you have asked about times as far as volunteering and stuff like that. If you're volunteering to work games, help with food, stuff like that, be here at 5.30. If you're going to do a trunk, be here by uh, 5 because we're going to start uh, closing that off so nobody can come into this parking lot on this side. Uh, we will ask that everybody come through the front over here as you park over here and come over here because we're going to give out free food and things, but we've got a system of how we need to monitor that. So if you will, just help us get everybody to the front. But we're starting at 6 o'clock till, till 8 p.m. We're going to have inflatables and all that stuff. We're going to have a fun time. But we know we took our kids yesterday to a few trunk or treats other churches had going on. And, man, it was just awesome to see these things get back to normal. We keep talking about that. But yesterday was one of those times we're seeing things get back to normal. Uh, but that, that'll be tonight. Uh, another one, and I know it's take he and I both to, to remember this or we'd both be in trouble, but we do have a wedding coming up. Uh, Miss Carly, Harold, Waylon, Rowell will be getting married in two weeks, um, November the 14th at 5. Uh, I'm sorry about all the power and all that stuff. We weren't able to get the slides up, but uh, we will have that visual next week. But uh, Harley's finally convinced Waylon to ask her, so. <laughs> I told Kenneth said, we're getting old. we got teenagers that's got babies now. we got teenagers getting married. I'm like, that's when you've been in youth ministry for a little while. But uh, on, on that note, what Pastor said to me, I'm going to get serious for a moment. Kate and I did what he said. I mean, overwhelmed. Um, I'm not talking about gift cards. I'm not talking about the, the blessings that you gave us. One of the best testimonies that I can give, and Kate and I, just, we stopped opening cards for a moment because we had one, we opened it up, and uh, it said, <laughs> my kids would not come to church until they came to your youth group, and now we can't stop them from coming to church. They, they would not come to church at all, and then, then they step foot in your youth group, and that has nothing to do with Kate and I, I promise you. Um, we, we are obedient to the of God and the Holy Spirit lead us in our services. But we thank you for everything that you guys do, not just yet last week, but all throughout the year for your appreciation of what we have in, in going on in our youth group. But I turn back over to the pastor. Thank you guys. Saving souls has to be our number one priority. Amen. Get the word of God out into people's hearts has to be our number one priority. Amen. And every time a soul is saved, that means that's one Satan going to get. Amen? Amen. And if we had spent all our energy in saving souls, then we've done exactly what God wants us to do. Uh, don't forget also, there's a mechanical bull tonight. So I think it's uh, ladies ride first. And then, uh, huh? <laughs> ladies 50 and over ride first. <laughs> Buy one, get one free. You fall off, you can get back home. All right, Bobby, are you Bobby? There you are. Okay. I need I need volunteers. Somebody raise their hand that's going to help next Sunday in the in, with the Carmen concert. That help, Bobby. Bobby, you want to write them down so you can go oh, here. Here, brother. I thought this might be the best way to do this. That way you'll have them, and we won't have to guess. Uh, all the people over here on the right side, if you raise your hand, it's going to volunteer. There's Jessica. I saw some more hands. There's Chuck and Johnny. Uh, yeah, I was like, what about That's not right. In the middle, got Derek and Emily. Keith, Beverly, Melanie, Mary Harold. Okay. Over here, on the left, got Carlton. So what we'll do is probably use 
this exists, but it's going to kind of head up our temperature scanning. Uh, so ladies probably, more or less, we'll have some guys that have the tables out front to do the scanning. If we have a, 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 a wheelchair need or something, we can bring them around to the side around here after we scan them or whatever. And then we'll need parking lot folks and a couple of ushers inside. So. And Johnny and Chuck. Bouncers. I hope we don't, but if we do. We got too many people in this church toting, man. I hope we don't I hope nobody has to bring nothing out. You good? Have we got enough or do I need to campaign some more? Okay, sounds good. Shedding his blood, 
for the remission of our sins. He paid the eternal price for all mankind's sin forever. So when the accuser of the brethren comes before God and accuses us, Jesus simply holds out his hands and his feet and says, here is the price that was already paid. Are then, Lord, forgive them. So, Father, we give you thanks for this cup this morning. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that redeemed us, that sanctifies us, that justifies us. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Thank you, Jesus. We'll dismiss our children now. The children's church. Praise the Lord. We'll have loads of fun. And learn about Jesus. Oh, God, that's fun.
And no one's ever caught him in a lie. No one's ever caught him not doing exactly what he said he would do. God figures that by now that we should have an unshakable faith in who he is. Amen? Let me ask you this question. Anybody in here own their own business? <coughs> Got a few people. Own their own business. So if you own your own business, then if, if, you, if someone says about your business, well, they're established. That would be a compliment, amen? That would mean that you've gone through all the situations that it takes to a place to become prosperous, if you will. To deliver what you advertise, amen? If you will. Okay, so 2 Chronicles 20, 20, the Bible says, So they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be Say it with me. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Established. Believe His prophets and you shall prosper. Thank you, sweetheart. Got one hand in the crowd going to flip to me anyway. I'll preach better even if he flips to me. Praise the Lord. Establish the word I looked it up in Webster's, and it simply means to be set in a secure position. Now let me ask you a question. Donnie, you own your own business. And bless your heart, it's a business full of other women. That's all you have working for you. Do you even have another one? You got one guy. One, you got one. But he's part-time because he won't work full of that nonsense. So let me ask you this question. If in your business, every single time you spent money on something, wisely or unwisely, when you went back and looked in your account, it was placed back in there for you by someone else. Praise the Lord. That whether you came up short or not, there was always, the bank was always full. Praise the Lord. Could you live in peace? If that took place in your business. I could sleep on a rock. Could you leave? Could you live in... That was my next question. Thank you. Could you be at rest? Alright, well let's turn that around into our spiritual lives. To our faith. What if every single time I poured out some faith, poured out some love, poured out some joy, poured out some peace, Poured out some kindness, and every time I look back, my bank account was back full again. That every time I did something for the Lord, He turned around, well, wait a minute, Lord, I'm trying to do something for you. I want to get ahead of you. No, but you ain't never getting ahead of me. What you give out for me, I'm going to give back to you and give it back double fold. Now, if I had a business like that, and I could lay down and rest in peace, then does it not stand? And that's a business that predicated. Pre I practiced that word this morning. <laughs> no, I'm playing. That's predicated on people coming and buying my product. So I'm dependent on people. Then what if, why can't I live in perfect peace and rest knowing that the God that I serve it's always going to make sure that my bank account is full. Mm -hmm. So Jehoshaphat told the people, and Jehoshaphat didn't have a lot. Jehoshaphat's like, hey man, hey man, we done for. There's an army so big that if we muster everybody in Israel, we can't stand against this army. And he went to the Lord, and the Lord showed up and just destroyed the army for him. Jehoshaphat had a reason to believe what he was saying. Believe in the Lord thy God, and you shall be established. Now, in Isaiah 7 9, the word, and it's in your strong concordance, it's number 539, it's the word amen. A M A N. And it simply means to build up or support or to foster as a friend. Now, let's see. I got God as my foster parent who's going to build me up and support me. What would keep me from living in his rest? If I believe that, if I trust that, if that's in my heart. Faith is like a business. In the beginning, just starting out, you got ups and downs, you got a learning curve.
Then it begins to prosper and build. And finally, after being there a while and proving itself, we say it's established. There comes a point in time when God expects our faith to be established. In other words, to deliver what is advertised. What I mean by that? Well, I stand up here and preach this word. Let's see. Uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. And that standard is my faith in Jesus. Uh, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that spitefully use you for it makes you more like your Father in Heaven. There comes a point in time when God expects me to grow up and be mature enough that I am established in my faith. That the Word that He has poured into me for 30 years eventually begins to produce fruit in my life. Amen? And now it's just not a Word anymore. Now it's become substance. Now it's become foundation. Now I'm standing on it every time. So the first thought that comes in my mind when I'm dealing with a situation is not what I think or what I see or what I feel, but what God says because that's what comes out of my mind. I don't have to feel it to say it. I don't have to feel it to believe it. I don't have to see it to believe it. Matter of fact, faith, faith commands that I believe it whether I see it or not. That's what faith means. So if my faith is going to be established, if I'm going to be rooted and established and firm in my faith, then I've got to believe what God says no matter what. If that makes any sense. <clears throat> Hebrews 8, 6. But now, he who has obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Jesus, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. In Genesis 17, God established a covenant with a man named Abram, where he changed his name to Abraham, the father of nations. But they never entered the rest because man couldn't keep his side of the agreement. Look at the covenant God made with Abraham. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. I'm not taking time to read the whole covenant. But God made a covenant with a man, with Abraham. Man couldn't keep their side of the covenant. The new covenant he cut with his own son who not only was able, but did keep his side of the covenant. According to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 through 7, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. What did the blood of bulls and goats do? All it did was cover it. It covered it. The sin was still there. It didn't take it off the table. It didn't remove it. It was sin there. So the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice of sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it was written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus was so firmly established in his faith, so firmly established and knowing who God was and what God was able to do. Jesus come and said, I've come for one reason, one reason only, baby, and that's to do, do, do your will. What is your will for me? Before he left heaven, he knew what God's will for him was. Our will's for you to live 30 years like a normal human being, go through all the trials, know what it's like, know what sleep is like tonight, know what being wore out tired is like, know what being uh, uh, mistreated by your siblings is like, know what, what, knowing everything you and I do, they go through. And then 30 years old, when it was time that Israel could, you could become a priest as a Jewish male, he took on his mantle for three years. He walked and he talked and he showed us what the Father looks like in the Father's heart. And then at the end of that time, we know that he went through his death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus said, come to do your will. Now, if you and I are going to be his disciples, and we're going to be his followers. And we're going to tell me one single time Jesus let what was going on around him mess him up or throw him off his curve. <laughs> tell me one time when he fell off the bull. He never did. And the only time he got upset, the only couple of times we see in the scriptures where he got upset at all was because he just, just hard-headed folks wouldn't, wouldn't see the truth. 
But more times than not, he was so merciful and gracious and kind, and he loved through anything. Think about this for a minute. He had Judas in his camp the whole three years he was doing ministry. Think about this for a minute. Now, if me and you was running a business, and we knew we had a Judas in the camp, the camera had shown him pilfering twins out of the cash register. You and I would get rid of that Judas, amen? Would we not? We would. I would. But Jesus understood that in order for God's will to be completed in his life, that he had to let God take care of everything for him. Have you ever thought about the storm that was raging and him being asleep in the boat? I mean, the storm was bad enough that all these other men, I mean, these were, these, these, these were, these were sissy men. These weren't men who played football for that other college. They probably played for the University of Alabama, you know, Barry Brown. Somebody said, quit that man. I didn't even know. I'm playing. These were men. And they were terrified. And Jesus is asleep. Why? Because he's at perfect rest. His faith is established in one who is able to take care of every situation in his life. You and I, once we get to the place where our faith is so established, it will not matter what anyone else is doing to you. It won't matter what anybody else is saying about you. It won't matter which political party is in power. It won't matter what's happening to a virus. It won't matter. Nothing in this world will matter. You will enter that rest. And Jesus said in Hebrews, we'll see it in a minute, we should have already entered that rest. By knowing what he's done for us. He was in a boat. He was asleep. And they woke him up. And he said, man, when y'all going to get it? It's going to be still. He said, the new covenant he cut with his son. There should be a certain rest involved with being established. The problem was then and still is today, Hebrews 3, 18 and 19. He said, in whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. The only thing that will keep us out from entering God's rest is unbelief in his word and who he is to us. What's, now let me ask this question. What's above ground? What we can see is only as strong as the root of what you can't see. Let me give you a great example. If you look at some of these big old huge oak trees that are blowing over in these storms, the ground gets wet, the tree blows over, but if you look at the root, you won't see a root longer than probably three or four or five or six feet. The trees that stand, that bend and sway and everything else in the storm, but they're still there. If you'll go down and look, below the ground, there's a root that goes down as far as the tree is tall. In every situation, I don't care what it is, you go look it up. Every tree that stands during the storm has got a root as deep as it is tall on the outside. So what I see in your life, Delray, above ground, is only atypical of what you've already got below ground. What's in our heart, the Word of God, the faith, everything else. When we look at a person's life, we look, man, they got it all together. No, they don't. They got a deep root. They're going through the same storms you and I are going through. They're dealing with the same doubts, the same sicknesses, the same family trouble, the same everything else. They just got an unshakable faith in a God who can't fail. And that's what they seem to do. They are established because they've gone through the hills and found trials and tribulations. You say, you know what? It's better just this right here. Instead of having, I don't know about y'all, but when I walk, I'd much rather walk on flat ground than I had going up down hills. Amen? It's a lot easier. It is. And that's the kind of faith God is talking about for us. The secret to have rest. Now, I want to ask this question for you because we're getting ready to go into the messages now. That was just preliminary. Because it's already, oh wow, that's a miracle. God turned back the time so we can win the battle today. He stopped the time. So, would you like a surefire way to know how to rest? Would you like to know how to be established? 
Well, here they are in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden light. I believe with all my heart the key three words in this whole entire scripture right here is learn of me. Learn of me. Come to me before you go anywhere else. Come to me before you go to your neighbor. Come to me before you go to your spouse. Come to me before you go to the gossip grapevine. Come to me before you go to Facebook. Come to me before you go anywhere else. Come. I am meddling. I know I'm meddling, but I'm preaching what he's telling me to preach. So if you're doing any of that other stuff or you're going to him, then you're not learning of him. Once you have truly learned what I did for you on the cross, your soul will be at rest and your faith will be established. If you will learn of me. How do we learn what, we did, what he did? So in order for you and I to understand what Jesus really did, we have to understand justification. If we will truly understand justification, this one truth will end every insecurity that you and I have in our lives. And we'll be able to rest. Two parts to our justification. There's two parts. The first part is, is to, to understand that we've been pronounced free from blame. We have been pronounced free from blame. The word is dicolosis, which means acquitted or innocent. You and I, through the blood of Jesus, through the sacrifice of Jesus, have been declared innocent. You say, but I'm not innocent. It don't matter whether you are or not. If the judge says you're innocent, you're innocent. If you go out to Monroe County Courthouse and you got a steam ticket for doing 105 and a 45, and you know you're guilty, and you say I'm guilty, and the judge says you're free to go, but how can I be free to go? Somebody else already paid you fine. So even though you're guilty, you're still free to go. You've been declared innocent by the judge. So the first part to justification to understanding it is, is we've been acquitted or we've been made in. Christ's work on the cross paid for our pardon from all sins. And then the second part of justification is to understand that we are accepted as righteous by God in Christ through faith. We are accepted by God. So Christ's work on the cross paid for our pardon from all sins and we are accepted by God in Christ through faith. Now, the problem is we've got an enemy to our rest. We've got an enemy that does not want you to be at rest. We've got an enemy that does not want you to be established. Why? Because he knows if you're established and you get in agreement with God and you begin to pray for a lost soul, he knows that God's going to begin to draw that lost soul to Jesus and for long, that dude's going to meet Jesus and he's going to get born again and that's the last thing Satan wants on this earth. And so Satan is always going to be after your testimony. He's always going to be after your rest. He don't want you established. Because if I'm establishing you, you ain't moving me, about. I don't care what's going on around me. I won't be moved by what's going on around me. I love it. I love that person. I love I'm praying for God. I pray you. Woo, God. Give them my blessing too, Lord. I already got so much. I can't handle what I got no way, Lord. Just bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them, God. I love them, Lord. I love them. Say it enough and it'll change you. It might not change them or their thoughts toward you, but it'll change you. I promise it will. It works. But well, we got an enemy to our rest, to our being established. Who is he? The accuser of the brother. And the second one is our conscience. Oh, come on now. We've got an accuser of the brother. He's the enemy of our rest. And in our conscience. Well, how can I be free? I did so and so. <laughs> it's not been paid. I've already proven that point to you. It's already been prayed. But I can't be, I'm not innocent. I'm getting, I'm getting nothing. It don't matter. Chris, it don't matter if you're guilty. You've already been paid for. And if we can't get that, then we will never understand justification and we'll never be able to walk free the way God wants us to be free. And we'll never want that for other people. Because we don't want for somebody else what I don't have for myself. I'll give you a word, for example. God said, Jesus said, there's only two commandments in the new covenant. There's only two. 
All the law and the prophets are summed up in two commandments, Jesus said. You and I could just get these two down that we'd have the whole Bible already taken care of. That to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, wait a minute now. If the accusers of the brethren in my conscience are convicting me and keeping me beat down and making me feel guilty and ashamed and remorseful all the stinking time, then how am I going to love Stephen? I'm going to love him in that same way. But he's just as guilty as I am. He's just as miserable as I am. He's just as pathetic as I am. So if that's the way we see ourselves, how am I going to love you, man? I'm going to love you as I love myself. So if I can only see me as this failure, this beat down, you know, pitiful, that can't get a day right in his life, then how am I going to love you? And that's why the church is not more powerful than she is because love is the most powerful entity in this universe. How do I know that? Because God is love. He's the most, I ain't like nobody's knocked him off this throne yet. And he loves us. Yes. Justification is not about guilt. God doesn't look down and go, well, you're not guilty. No. He doesn't. God recognizes our guilt. He knows we're guilty. How do I know he knows we're guilty? Because he sent Jesus. And if God didn't realize we were guilty, he didn't ever send Jesus. So he's not, it's not like he overlooks. It's not like the judge up there says, well, I, I know you really wasn't going 105 and 45, but, but my policeman must have been lying. No! That judge knows you're guilty. He just knows that somebody's made to find. Is this making any sense to anybody? Well, I hope it is. Because God helped me with this thing when he told me. So we got two enemies. The accuser of the brethren in our conscience. <coughs> Excuse me. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser are our brethren who accuse them before our God day and night to be cast out. And then Romans 2, 15 says, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness of between themselves their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. And more times than not, it's accusing us of that our conscience huh? We don't let ourselves off the hook very much, do we? And you know because we don't let ourselves off the hook, you know who else we don't let off the hook? We expect everybody in here to be perfect. Oh, come on now. I just, somebody give me an amen. I'm preaching now. Amen. We expect Christians to be perfect. We expect Christians to be perfect, but God doesn't. God says that He's ransomed us in our guilt. In our guilty states is where He has saved us. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I don't know how long that yet's going to last. Maybe until I draw my last breath. I don't know so far I've got a proven track record that I mess up. But one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to wallow in yesterday. I refuse to wallow in yesterday. One of my heroes, the Apostle Paul, said one thing I do for getting those things that are behind me, I'm pressing on because I can't do anything about it. I'm guilty. So we stand before God with our hand, heads hanging low because of Satan accusing us and our conscience convicting us. We know I am guilty before God. And God doesn't deny our guilt. He can't lie. He never sees us as innocent. Our justification has nothing to do with our being innocent. When we are pardoned by God, it is as guilty lawbreakers. He never vindicates us, but instead forgives us, pardoning our sins by His grace and mercy alone. And He expects us to do the same thing for each other. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am He who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will remember your sins no more. Now God's got a lot better memory than you and I do. And here's, if He's forgetting sins, guess what you and I should be doing? Isaiah 38, 17, You have cast all my sins behind your back. Micah 7, 19, You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Our lawyer, our advocate, stretches forth his nail-scarred hands 
to the court in front of our accuser and he says all these charges you brought against them here are true but I took their place I paid the penalty for every single one of them Satan accuser you have no grounds to accuse my client you have no case my client is three and Satan slinks out of God's court we can hear our Lord cry out in Romans 8 33 oh come on who shall bring a charge against God's elect what it says in Romans 8.33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? So if Jesus sits there and cries that out, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? If he doesn't, then who is? And he's the only one. He's the one that they can do. Thank you, Lord. So, two parts to our justification. Christ's work on the cross parts is and now the second part, we are accepted by God. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. It says that as such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When Jesus went to the cross, listen to this now, this is important. Please get this. When Jesus went to the cross, he crucified our old man. And when Jesus finished and sat down, God said, from now on, I only recognize one person as righteous. One person in this whole universe who I recognize as righteous. Anyone who comes to me must come through him. So you've got to understand something to understand justification. When God looks at you now, he never sees you. All he sees is Jesus. Mm. Why? Because I'm in him. And God doesn't have an x-ray machine where he can single out liver from lung, from spleen, from kidney, from all that. So when he looks to look for me now, all he sees is Jesus. And that's the part of the justification that we've got to get down in our spirits, man. My name's in the book. My name's in the book. Come on, say it with me. My name is in the book. I'm going through I'm going through. I'm not going down. I'm not going under. I'm, not, I'm already justified. I'm already made righteous. I'm already holy. In God's eyes, He don't even see me. All He sees is Jesus. When somebody brings up the name of Alan Robinson in heaven, God goes looking for him. All He sees is Jesus. And I'm righteous because I'm in Him. Ephesians 1 6 says, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Oh, praise God. <coughs> That's why it's so important to abide in Him, to come to Him first when you fail. Jesus, my only plea is Your blood. My only plea. I got somebody tip. Somebody give me something. I don't want to call no names. I might get in trouble. I'm thinking about somebody in here with the biggest bank account in here. But I can tell you right now, when you're 85, 90 years old, that bank account don't matter no more. That's right. You know what? You realize there's things more important than that bank account. You know what? My hope ain't in that bank account no more. Now, I understand when you're 40, 50, 30, you're raising kids, you're trying to pay for a house and all that stuff. I understand that things are a little different. But I promise you, the older you get, the more you realize that the only hope you have is in Him. Amen. There's no good in me. The harder I try to do good, it's when I end up doing The harder I want other people to do good, it's when they do worse. I don't care who we are, we were made for failure. We come in this world for failure because Adam made the apple. And we can say, well, Adam messed it up. No, he didn't because if it was me and you, we made the apple. We still eat it today. How do I know? Because we'll believe his lie over God's truth. So if it wasn't Adam, it would have been us. Amen? So listen, that's why we must go to Him before we go to anything else. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it was written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That's right. If you want to glory in anything this morning, you better go. I'm... I'm, I'm Look, look, I am I'm pathetic. I am pathetic. I'm useless. Everything Satan says about me is true. Except but God. But God. Because Jesus lives inside me, and once he moved in, he made everything right. 
And so now I don't have to worry about going to God on my own. I don't have to worry about going to God and Satan start laying out all, well, 105 and 45, uh, you cussed your wife, uh, you beat your children, you kicked your dog, uh, all those accusations that he goes up there and stands before God. Every single time you sin, he goes straight up there and throws it up in God's face. Now, wait a minute, you kicked me out of heaven because of my pride. You go get it, go get it right now. Imagine Satan sitting up there doing that. You know he's doing that. You kicked me out of heaven over my sin. What are you going to do about Jessica's? And Jesus just steps up there smiling and goes, Look, Bella. Remember these? Remember these? That was already paid for. Yours didn't get paid for. That's the whole point of justification right there. We are guilty. Every one of us are guilty. I don't care if she's been singing in the choir for six years and has baked 4,000 cakes and given half her money to missionaries all around the world. I don't care if she's guilty. She's guilty. You see her the way Jesus sees her, the inside, the thoughts, and everything else, and I'm telling you, she's guilty. We all guilty. But Jesus made us righteous. Jesus paid. Yeah, we're still guilty. I did it. But I ain't got to pay for it. Because he paid for it for me. That's why it should be so easy to worship him. That's why it should be so easy to thank him. That's why it should be so easy to forgive other people that have wronged us. That's why it should be so easy to walk and live in humility. Because the only hope I have is you. I'm gone without you. I'm lost without you. I don't have anything without you. You're my only hope. Our old man is dead. Justification by faith is the most humbling thing in the world. That we must set aside our constant strivings and just rest in Him. Our old man is dead and the new man in us is Jesus. God fully accepts Him and us also as we place our faith in Him. Once we realize what Jesus accomplished on the cross... We'll hate sin even more. We'll obey Him more. We'll pray to Him more. We'll yearn for Him more because He's established us on the sure rock of His grace. Then we can say, who can accuse me now? Christ has justified me and I am accepted by God. You can't have a bad hair day when you realize that Christ has justified you and you are accepted by God. Jesus has justified me. He's paid for everything. And I am accepted by God. How you going to not rest? How you going to not be established? How you not going to want to act like Jesus and look like Jesus and talk like Jesus and love like Jesus and forgive like Jesus and, and show grace and mercy? People said to me, I've heard this said before, the only Jesus anybody's going to see is me. That's going to praise God. That ain't true. Thank God that ain't true. Praise the Lord that ain't true. Because if only Jesus ever see is in me, then I'm in we, we, we all in trouble. Because I don't always act like Jesus or look like Jesus. The Bible says Jesus said to himself, no man can come to me unless my Father draws him. And then once the Spirit of God has drawn a person to Jesus and they're born again, they redeem. If God has accepted them, and we certainly do. Amen? Amen? 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate for the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, the only righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Praise God. You've got a lawyer. Run to him now. Let him plead your case and then you'll know his rest and be established. Everything that comes up, run to your lawyer. Plead your case. Talk to him. If he says, just leave it alone, I got this, and leave it alone. If he says, go and home with you, go and home with you. Do what he tells you to do. Amen? Because 1 John 1, 8 and 9 tells us, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've given you the surefire way. No, I had the Lord's given you the surefire way this morning 
to rest in his rest and be established. So that these winds and these storms and this stuff that comes along, sorry dude, you ain't moving me. Oh, you may bend me a little bit, that's okay. But what you see above ground is supported by something that's deeper underground. And that's our faith. Our faith establishes us. If we're not firm in our faith, we're not going to be firm at all. That's what Isaiah 7 9 says. He was a pretty sharp dude. God trusted him a lot. Establish yourself, saints. Establish yourself. What does the Word of God say? Jesus said, Abide in me, and let my Word abide in you. And you shall be my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. His truth, His Word. He's loved us. He's proven to us how much He loves us and how far He's willing to go. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for every person in this room, Lord. I pray, God, that as you have dealt with my heart over this word, Lord. And God, Lord, have mercy. We still in, we train every day, Lord, because you show us, you find us, you never leave us where we are. You're always compelling us. And if you're out there this morning and you're watching God, Facebook or other means. Please know how much God loves you. How far He was willing to go to save you. And not only save you, but to establish you and give you a rest, a real for true rest down in your heart, down in your spirit, down in your mind. <coughs> Those thoughts that come, they're not from God. They're the enemy. And the Bible tells us to cast down every vain imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. To take every thought captive to the glory of Jesus. If it's not a good thought, a happy thought, a thought, a love thought, then cast that thing down because it's coming from the accuser or the brethren or either from your conscience. Cast it down. Don't dwell on it. My name is in the book. I'm established. I'm at rest because Jesus has done it all for me. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, if you hadn't hired Him as your lawyer, let me put it that way. If you hadn't paid down the down payment to hold His services, retain His services, if you will, then the Bible says that all you've got to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised Him from the dead, then I shall be saved. With the mouth I make confession, with the heart I believe. God wants us to repent. Stop going the way you're going and turn around and start following Him. Abide in Him. Let Him put your, his, your name in the Lamb's book of life and add you to the saints' roll call list. If you're here this morning, you're listening out there, all you've got to do is fall on your knees and ask Jesus to be your Lord. Confess your sins. Repent. Ask God to forgive you and establish you. If you're here this morning, you're saying your name's in the book, but you've let all kinds of winds and storms and waves move you in every direction, and you don't feel very established, and you certainly haven't been living with any rest, then you need to get your faith reaffirmed. You need to get your faith back on that rock. Jesus said, the man who builds his house on this rock, no matter what comes, it shall not be moved. And if that's you this morning, you would admit it to the Lord. Would you slip your hand up and write that down? Thank you for your honesty all over this place. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I've already done this. I did this yesterday morning. God, that they would reestablish their foundation, Lord. That they would remember what you did for them. We are already justified. You've already paid the price. God has already accepted us. When he looks at us, he sees Jesus. And God, there's nothing Satan can do about that, Lord but run above. So Father, I pray today as we reestablish ourselves, Lord, that we will rest. That your people will both lie down in peace and sleep when you give it your beloved rest. Pray this for your people today. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people say it. Thank God for his word if it bless you, if you would. Amen. Thank you, Lord.